everyone welcome to the Sreshta purposefully passionate about domestic abuse awareness series this series is intended to help women who are in domestically abusive situations but may not realize it a lot of women are in these situations but they think it is normal we recognize abuse as physical mainly but abuse can also be mental emotional economic and a whole host of other things the intent of this series is to bring awareness to these types of abuse through survivor stories, therapists, and also a legal team. And I also have some coping mechanisms as well as part of the series. So the intent is that a woman watching this would be able to assess if possibly she's going through something abusive or maybe unhealthy and strive to make a safe change in her life whether that means discussion with her partner if she is able to do that or whether it means that she needs to do something a little more serious and exit the relationship. So today I'm excited to welcome one of my good friends, Terentia. Terentia is actually the name of a priest. In Greek it means guardian. When Terentia first got married, her, hus her ex-husband was constantly playing online games. She spent her free time either reading or watching TV. She asked herself, she thought to herself, sorry, that this is what married life was supposed to be. She remembered telling her, her dad telling her maybe she should take an interest in what her husband at the time was doing so she could bond more with him. At that time, she said she wasn't as wise, so she took her dad's advice. She started playing this online game along with her then husband, which was a real-time game from different people around the world. Not too long after, she made friends with a group of people, which then became her family. She created a character, which was a priest, to heal, and she named her Terentia. Terentia means guardian in Greek. These are the people who gave her a hope for a better tomorrow when she saw no light at the end of the tunnel. To this day, she is still friends with them and she is referred to as Terentia, their guardian, their big sister. She is the mother of three awesome boys and one amazing girl. She is a God-fearing woman of the Muslim faith. She is productive, optimistic and positive. She's a domestic violence survivor, an advocate for women, voice for the voiceless, hope for the hopeless, and she is an introvert. In respect of her qualifications, she would have gotten her degree, but her ex-husband had broken a promise to her dad when he said he would continue to send her back to school. He told her instead she should stay home and see about the children. She started a certified accountant technician course and completed two exams. She has a certification in supervisory management and also completed an accounting assistant course. She intends to further her studies in communication and public relations when things get better. She takes it one day at a time, being grateful and happy for the mercies from above. So I know it was a lot, but this is to tell you how much, how multifaceted, multidimensional, how full of love that Tarantia is. So I welcome Tarantia. This is an anonymous interview, so you wouldn't see her face, but she is passionate about helping to make a difference and she really wanted to help me with this. So Tarantia, I know I said a lot, but I will ask you to say Anything else you want to say about yourself in respect of your being an advocate for women, a voice for the voiceless, for the hopeless, or anything else you would like to share? Thank you, Shrestha. Um, it really means a lot for me to be a part of this, as you know. Um, you know, I've tried my best since meeting you, of course, to support you in whatever endeavors because... I believe that you're a person that would be able to make a lot of change. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, what can I say? 
I'm very uh, a simple person. Um, the person that I was years ago to where I am now, completely different. I mean, I was more quiet and um, I mean, I let people be my voice. But from the things that I've learned from being married in the situation that I was in, and I've learned a lot of things along the way. And I've learned, or I've learned mostly that no one else can be a voice for me. And when I found my voice, two things happened. I lost a lot of people who were either my family or my friends. But in that process, I gained a lot of people that became my family and became even more close, closer friends. About two months prior to leaving my husband, my ex-husband, mm -hmm. um, he turned around and he told me, he said, no one is going to want a woman with three kids. He says, you have nothing. And to me at that point in time, I had reached a point where I don't care if I have nothing, but I know that there is better. And it may not come as easy as I'd hope it come, but I'm willing to fight for better. So in doing so, I remembered he left for work and I took up my children, my three kids at that time. And I had only $200 to my name, $200. And I went to my mom and I told her, that's it, that's it. And she asked me if I was sure. And I was like, yes, I'm, I'm done. And my sisters at the time, my two sisters, my mom, thankfully I had their support. And uh, I started looking for a job. And within two months of leaving my husband, my ex-husband, I, I found a job. I mean, it wasn't anything spectacular, but it was something. And that was a small victory on my part. Right. I just kept going and going and going. And um, at that point in time, my mom had found a place for me to stay and to rent. And I was working for 2,500. I remember that my first job and my rent was 2,500. But I told her, I said, no, we will do this. So while I worked to pay rent, my sisters in the process, they helped me with traveling money and you know taking care of the kids, the kids' expenses, et cetera. Because at that point in time, my ex-husband, his mentality was she's going to suffer. She's going to suffer and then she's going to come back. Okay. Yeah. And well, I, I never went back. I, I am so, I guess because we're friends, I know, I mean, I know how incredibly difficult it was for you, but just this, this strength to have someone and, and we'll start at the, at the top of your story. Right. But, Mm -hmm. To have someone who is supposed to be your, your partner and your companion and, and support in life give you, give, give you reasons why nobody would want you using mm -hmm. your children who you love and sort of threatening your, your well of safety with that speaks volumes to what is actually mental abuse and emotional abuse. Um, using children is actually something that happens a lot. I'm not sure if it is because the mother is so invested in the children, but things like threatening the, the partner with taking children or that is something that ha that happens a lot in domestically abusive situations, which is what which is what you went through. And thankfully, you were able to to leave. And I'd, I, I would like you to speak about how you gathered up the courage to leave because you said you only had $200, which is financial insecurity. Um, and well, at, at least you had your, your mom and stuff. But how did you gather up, up the courage to leave? We were married for 10 years. And in that 10 years, 
there are so many things that compounded on each other. But at that time, my mentality was I'd stay for the kids. Right. I so remember you start at the beginning, like maybe we could just start at the beginning, like how you met mm-hmm. and how you decided to get married and, and what you looked forward to and what it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Well, he was known to the family. Okay. And um, I was 18 at the time. Um, now, my life has not been the ideal in the sense of I did not grow up with my mother and I do not know till this day who is my father. So I ended, I ended up um, living with my mother's brother, his wife, his children, his mother. And up till this day, I call him dad. That's the man I know as dad. That's the only person I call as dad. And um, he, of course, considers me his daughter, one of his. So uh, my mom used to stay at that time there, but she remarried when I was five years old. And um, she went to live with her husband. But at that point in time, there was a lot of insecurities about a girl going to live with her stepfather, et cetera, et cetera. So they left me there with her, with my grandparents and my uncle, which is my dad, of course. And um, I didn't understand much, but growing up and you're going to school and you hang everybody with their mom and their dad. And, you know, you, you start questioning yourself as to, hmm, well, my mom doesn't live with me. And at that point in time, I thought my dad was my dad you know, but then I heard a conversation that they were brother and sister. So I, at that age, young age, was very confused. I was like, hmm, what's going on? But when I got to find out the truth and everything, um, that kind of hurt a lot. And I felt neglected and alone. How old were you when you found out? I was about seven. And I grew up with this thing in my mind as, you know, a feeling betrayed you know um but i i went on and i always felt left out even though my father didn't particularly show any favoritism because he ended up having two kids who i also called my sisters um you see you tend to feel a little left out and then my mom remarried and she had two kids with her so Everybody has the ideal family. You're looking now, well, my uncle is married. He has his two kids. My mom, she's married. She has her two kids on that side. And then you look at it like, okay, well, I didn't have that opportunity, you know? So I've always wanted a family of my own. And things weren't going great with me and him, my dad. At 18, um, I wasn't seeing eye to eye with my dad mainly because I, deep inside, I think I was holding a lot of things against him, even though I know it wasn't, well, I know now it wasn't in his control. But, you know, at 18, being a teenager, not knowing a lot of things. So um, my ex-husband, he was, he was known to my dad, he was around the family, etc. And my ex-husband, his mom came a time and she was like, you know, he's nice. He's a good person for you. Um, He'd give you this, he'd give you that. And because no one in the family had anything bad to say about him, I thought to myself, well, this could be, you know. So it's not like we dated or anything. It was sort of like his mom came and she spoke to me and I took it as an opportunity to run away from my problems as per se and start a family of my own. The, The one thing that I dreamt of and so yeah that's how everything came to be okay but that is normal at that time though that is normal because i I know well you're muslim and i'm hindu and Mm -hmm. in in the hindu religion i mean that's how marriages used to happen as well um Mm -hmm. the parents would meet the parents and then the they would talk to the either would talk to the children and they probably see each other once and decide. So, I mean, probably now in, in this day and age, it might sound a little bit strange. 
Mm-hmm. But at that time, I know that was very normal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Ivan is, is very honest to say that you you took the opportunity and the opportunity to run away. Um, one of the one of the things that in doing this and even working on myself, I have found is that our childhood <clears throat> affects us so much. So so even like in your mind, you know, you felt a little bit left out. Everybody, whether they were in a nuclear family or not. There is something about their childhood that makes them feel some way. It might be lonely, it might be unaccepted, it might be sad. There, there is something. And, and I really do believe that how we grow up actually affects a lot of how we behave in, in those kind of younger years. Mm-hmm. So um, I agree. Yeah, which is, which is part of why I want to do this as well. And, and some of the things I will ask the therapist when I, when I speak to her. So, I mean, you took the opportunity to run away, but you must have had a, a picture in your mind of what your marriage would be like. Well, from my idea, it would have been we would have got married, have kids, and, you know, we would have just lived, you know. I know that I know definitely from seeing my dad and his marriage that you'd have arguments and stuff. So I knew that was normal. Um, so I had this sort of a fairy tale in my mind of what my marriage would have been like. Yeah. But then there's a difference now that I understand fairy tale reality two way completely different things. Mm -hmm. And that's the books we grew up on, right? The fairy tales. Correct. Correct. No one actually tells you the real things that happen. They build up your hopes as, as, you know, this Prince Charming must always be there to, to, to save you, to be there for you. But it does not tell you that you have to be your own hero. So go ahead. So you got married and then what happened? Well, we were pretty much normal for the first month. Second month, yeah. I think... Um, it was in July, so August, September. I think in October, because we got married in July. So in around October or so, we had an argument. And um, because my dad lived a few houses away, I told my ex-husband at the point in time, I was like, you know what? I'm going by my dad. I needed some space to clear my head. And he took me and he locked me in the bedroom. And at that point in time, I had now found out that I was three months pregnant with our first child. Yeah. And he locked me in the bedroom and I remember screaming and banging on the door, but there was a lock outside. So even though he, you know, I couldn't get open it from the inside. Yeah. So it was that. And after. So little- came, did he, well, he eventually let you out, obviously. But yes. How he left you for a while. Yeah, he left me for a while. And then when he eventually um, let me out, I remember calling him. It was like, you know, you just got married. And um, this is not something that you should, you know, be trying to get out of now. So he says, your dad Prop- knew that he locked you in the room? Correct, yes. And he did say he would call and speak to him. But I told him, but. I don't want to be married. This is not this the picture that you guys are get, that gave me of him is not what's happening here. And he was like, "Well, you just got married, and you're pregnant now. So why are you going to leave? It makes no sense leaving now." And my my family and I believe more so a lot of people, but my family has this mentality that. If you're in a, a married, that's it. It doesn't matter what you go, go through in the marriage. You, yeah. Yeah, it's not your family alone. A lot of people have that that mentality. And that is really from societal construct. But go, I don't want to stop your story. So go ahead. Yeah. It progressed uh, a lot of things. It was a lot of verbal. And because my dad spoke to him, um, he stopped for a little while and then I remember we, we had our first child and um, he was being quite, how to put it, 
He was being verbal, ver- verbally abusive. Okay. Because it started like that, you know, he would tell you about your size, he would insult you, he would say certain things. And it was then I just started ignoring him. And um, I remember telling my mom the things, because we used to talk, telling her what I was going through. But, you know, she, well, she had her take on this whole thing that these things happen in marriage and you have to just learn to work it through. So to a point I felt like, wow, nobody's listening to me. And I thought to myself, well, where am I going to go anywhere? Because my dad has this take on it. My mom has this take on it. And there's nobody on your side. Um, Then, well, my mother-in-law tried to get into the entire fray because she wanted to dictate um, where I go and what I wear and those things. And my ex-husband, well, he had no issue with that. There was one time I remember for Eid and I dressed up and I didn't dress up as how she wanted me to dress up. I wore whatever I wanted. And I remember he coming home and telling me, um, well, my mom didn't like what you wear. She said that you shouldn't wear something like that again. And I tell, I told him, I was like, your mom can't tell me what to wear. I am my own woman. And I was in the kitchen at that time. And by then I had my two boys. And I remember him just barging in the kitchen, holding me by my neck and leaning me. Now it's a two-story house. So the kitchen window, he held me. My middle of my back was literally out of the window. So I was literally like hanging out and he held my throat and wow, he was squeezing it and he was telling me, don't ever say anything against, uh, against his mother again. And I remember holding him very tightly because if he dropped me, well, I mean, he would have have probably had to come too. So, yeah. So, and then he took his fist and, and, um, he put it against my eye and we scuffled a little bit and yeah I ended up with a blue eye and that was the first time he was physical and this was after how long this was when um my first was two years and the other boy he was a year so that was like four years two years two years three years into marriage yeah it was like that for a while. I told my mom and then she came and she spoke to him. But then after he didn't, he didn't hit per se, but what he did, he held me tightly, pushed me and, and, and squeezed me. Things that didn't, didn't leave marks or evidence. Okay. Yeah. And all the time you're just thinking you have to stay for the for children. The children. Yes. Yes. So it was then, um, it's only now I understand certain things. Like, for example, there are times that he wanted to have sex, but I didn't want to. And he forced himself on me and stuff. But at that point in time, I was like, well, it's my husband. But now when you actually read and you're aware of certain things, you realize that that's rape. And you could be raped during and even during your marriage yeah Yeah. so of course I had my daughter so I try not to really tell them these things because you don't really you don't want your kids thinking well was I here by accident or did my mom and dad actually decide to conceive me you know so well I I think well I understand why you wouldn't want to tell your kids but yeah I mean at the end of the day um, Terentia, I know you love, you absolutely love your children and, and I they do. are, yes, yeah, so it, it doesn't matter. Things happen in our lives and, and sometimes the way it comes is not the most perfect. It, it may be horrible and, and horrific, but sometimes through that, that horrifying journey, mm. we get something that's really beautiful. It, it might not have been the ideal way, but... I know you love your children, so don't don't worry about that too much. 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I love them a lot. Too much. <laughs> uh, that's a, 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 a matter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I remember leaving once um, when my daughter was, um, she was here. Yeah, she was three days shy of being a year. And I went to my mom and I told her that I was really, really tired and I couldn't handle it anymore. And my mom, my mom didn't say anything. I stayed there. And then I remember my ex, he came and he spoke to them and he tried to shift the blame on me. And he was saying that, I wasn't doing this and I wasn't doing that. But the thing is, he wanted me to sweep at a certain time, mop at a certain time, make sure that I cook at a certain time. He wanted the children to be in bed by a certain time. But in the aspect of he wanted to sort of timetable me then to mm -hmm. schedule. And I told him children are unpredictable. Now, though I told my, I, I had made that eight o'clock, you know, seven, eight o'clock is their bedtime. But, you know, he wanted it to be done immediately. Now, children, you can, you know, you have kids, you, are, you have your daughter. You know that, yeah, you might want to put your child to bed at eight, but. It this, doesn't happen that way. Yeah, yeah. And he if it wasn't done on time he would get angry with me if I didn't sweep the house if he came home that was a problem and uh, yeah I couldn't speak to anybody he didn't even want me speaking to my friends that I had from school my girlfriends I couldn't speak to anybody okay. at that point in time he was at the point of where I, he told me that I should only have Muslim friends. And I'm like, but why? Why should I only have Muslim friends? And he was like, well, you know, you don't want to be corrupted. And I'm like, how are they going to corrupt me? I barely go out to do anything. Because my time was going by my mom or my dad or home. And that was it. And the only time that I went out in public is if he were with me. So how did you decide um, to leave? It came a point in time where um, things were getting really, really bad. And uh, he reached a point where he didn't even want me to go by my parents. And um, I felt really 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 caged I felt as though my mind was going to explore I didn't even want to live at that point in time that's how bad it had gotten he even disconnected the internet and um, so I had no forms of communication and um, and one day well, I moved out of the room and I went into the other room to sleep because I just couldn't. I just couldn't. And it had, a been, it had been a year and I moved out of the room. And he had no issue with that because um, I stumbled across um, an email of his. Um, he was actually courting another woman online okay. while being married to me. And the conversation was, you know, my wife is a terrible person. She doesn't do anything. She doesn't love me. She doesn't love the kids. She's horrible to them. And I remember sitting there just shocked, absolutely shocked. And this, this person painted me in such a way that I was terrible, terrible. And my mom and my dad knew for a fact that I was doing everything, every single thing. And when I saw that, and he even, he even took her out for lunch. And he gave her flowers. And I was like, wow, I am absolutely nobody, nobody. 
so there was a time when I'm I did I did talk to him about it and he was angry that I invaded his privacy and stuff like that and there's there was an argument and the three kids were in my room at that point in time and he just barged in and we started to argue and he slammed me against the wall and I remember the children crying and because I saw them cry and because I saw their faces at that point in time that is when I decided that I had to leave I'm trying to summarize the things you went through I mean it, this is not only abuse from a partner this is family abuse because his mother played a very big role and in, in enabling enabling the abuse and yeah. and this is one of the things that your your story is so is so powerful because there are so many women in this situation where something happens and the response from the people that you love is that you need to try and work it out you need to try and please him and while it may be well intended or come from a place where they think is good this is so damaging to the woman in the relationship to always have to be the one to try and please or to be flexible or to adjust and to sacrifice who she is and her own freedom to the point where you are expected that it is a normal expectation and then even when it, it gets worse and it really it seems like a, an someone who who just needs you for a convenience and needs you needs to control you so that convenience enables a good life for that person and he doesn't have to do anything and worse yet when a mother gets involved a mother who is also a woman gets involved and also enables the controlling to the point where they want to tell you what to wear and when you stand up for yourself it turns physical and you know you you keep you kept on because the people around you are telling you that you need to try to to work it out with him and yes they they kind of back you up in some sense because they try to talk to him for you so in their own way um they're trying to help and and this is not for the people who are watching this is not to blame anyone everyone acts on their own place it may have been well intentioned because of the generations before us they grew up like this and it was normal for them but this is why i i really want wanted to do this series because things like this is not normal it's not normal when someone reaches out to you especially as a mother or as a sister or as a friend it's not normal and it's not right for the woman's well-being to say try and work it out what is normal is for you to either say let's meet let's talk and then you can decide if it is in 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 Taraja's case you need to leave and the, the thing that touches me with your story because i relate to it is at the point where you decide you really need to get out is at the point where you see it affecting your children because women they will take whatever they will take it but when you see how a child is affected by someone's behavior that is usually the point in time when you decide you don't want your child growing up like this and i am i am so happy that at that point in time you were strong enough with the 200 dollars in your pocket and nowhere really to go but by your mom that you gathered up the courage to leave and even since then since since you have left what what has it been like and how did you cope through that exit because even going through that sometimes well you said you never wanted to go back but there are times when women want to go back and then there are other things that happen that make it extremely difficult um to exit such such that like in your case he wanted to make you suffer so that you would come back how did you cope and go through all of those things i had my times where i left yes but i did go back because he came and he promised certain things and 
you know, the usual. They give you all the sweet words and everything that you want to hear. I had my phases. And, but the, 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 last, the last time, the last straw was when he slammed me against the wall in front of the kids. That was the last time. And I'd never got the urge to go back. I never did. Because at some point in time, enough is enough. And I really appreciate and I thank the support that I got from my mother and my, my sisters. I mean, it was, I mean, it wasn't ideal, but I remember all of us sleeping in one room. You know, my mom, my two sisters, me, my three kids. And um, because my mom, she doesn't have a big house. But we all, she she supported me. She said, "Okay, we're gonna make this work, and we're gonna make we're gonna make sure these children survive. You will survive. Your kids will survive. Everything will be all right." Because I think she reached a point where she saw that there was frustrate, frustration in my eyes, and I think, you know, I don't know, and I have never asked why she never said, you know, try to work it out. Um, but. I remember her just looking at me and she's saying, don't worry, everything will be fine. It has been hard. It has not been easy. But every little, what I did was every small victory, it doesn't matter how tiny, or how small, anything that went in my favor, I considered it a victory. I didn't consider it, oh, things are moving too slow for my pace. I took everything that was coming at me with, an, with a lot of gratitude. I was thankful for anything because at the end of the day, you mean we're, we're getting everything handed to you, but things were coming to you because of, you know, your efforts. And after that first, first job that I had, I worked for six months. I got something else that paid 3000 and I, I remember having a conversation once with someone and, you know, they, a lot of, a lot of employers out there look for people who have been working years and years and they ask the question, you know, well, why do you keep moving or, you know, why? And from in my case, it's hard to explain to an employer that, listen, as much as I am doing the work and I'm capable of doing the work, but at the end of the day, I'm going to where is going to pay me more money. And at that point in time, that was the case for me. I left my job for another one that was paying me 3000 And for somebody that might say, well, why you leave your job from twenty five to 3000 For me, 3000 was a lot because now I could afford to pay my own traveling and my rent. And that was easing a burden off my siblings. And that's how it was for me. Yeah, I don't even think that's a, a fair question, though. I mean, we all need to live. So yeah. even as an employer, and, and I, I do work in, in the corporate world, it's mm -hmm. clear that if it is you are getting um, something that would give you a better life, I, I don't think that's a question on, on why you would move yeah yeah well so i mean if you're an employer and, you, and you're looking at at this i mean it is something con to consider if this is a learning point for you yeah. or something to take back because yeah i mean in in general i mean p persons anybody it, it doesn't even have to be um a person in your situation anybody who is looking to sustain their life and is getting an a better opportunity i don't respectfully don't think it is fair to look down on that person the person is a human being and the person needs to live so but, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to ask someone that well it's not fair to us but that's a lot of it's a stereotype given to women who are fighting to, to, to survive and it's something that you consider because I mean I've gone I've, I've worked places but I've also didn't tell my story to these places 
because when you do look at it, people judge you. They do. Mm-hmm. And when they think and they look at you as a domestic violent, a person of domestic violence who was in that situation, they automatically consider you weaker. And I didn't say this because out of the blue, it's I've experienced it twice. And I've, I've become a lot more aware of certain things because of course I had to explain to certain well a couple employers why I had to be at court and it's not something that you can get out of because you have to show up for court at the end of the day so yeah there are certain circumstances where you have to explain a situation and yeah but I remember when you do explain the situation, they look at you differently. They do. It has nothing to do with, it doesn't affect my work because it never did. But for some reason, when you explain a situation like that, they start to see you differently. So that is actually discrimination. And I mean, again, if you're a hiring manager or employer and you're looking at this, these are things to take and to consider with your HR or, or your management team. Women go through so much, and, and but it is to understand that we all, everyone has something that they are going through. You hire someone for their skills and what they can bring to the job, knowing that we are all human and we all have things that we're chasing. And I, I think the message from that is to consider and be gentle with those that you are hiring. When once you know that they can, can perform Discrimination is not something that helps a company. It actually can do the opposite. The more we support persons who work for us, the more we make our places engaging and a better place to work, the the better persons we would attract. And a, a good employee is not an employee with zero issues because we are all human. So in going through your your job search, and you spoke about court, right? So you would have filed for divorce, I assume? Yes, I did. Okay. And so for the listeners, could you explain what that was like? Well, of course, I did not have money to afford a lawyer. So I had to go through legal aid. That process in itself... And I'm not saying it to turn off anybody, but it's a long process. And if you're not willing to really stick to your guns, you're going to give up halfway. But I end up getting through with legal aid. And um, they assigned me a lawyer, a female lawyer at the time. And uh, they usually ask you everything so they can do the papers and stuff and whatever. And I submitted everything and um he responded and it turned into a very nasty court battle because he realized that i was not going for a house or or land or or his money i was actually interested in just my kids and when he realized that all i wanted from him was the kids he turned it into a very nasty battle. And it reached a point where at one point in time, I reconnected with one of my friends from school. And where well, she's she's my she's my very best friend. And she's also been there in my journey. And um I remember, you know, clonging around on Facebook and putting that I was married to her. And believe it or not. <laughs> He actually screenshotted that because at that point in time, you know, um, he, yes, he was my friend on Facebook. No, he was not my friend on Facebook. It was actually a family member, sorry. A family member screenshotted it and sent it to him. And he filed that in court saying that I should not be around my children because I am a lesbian. Yeah. And he came up with all sorts of accusations because the place that I was renting was, um, it's a four bedroom 
it's a four bedroom um, place with kitchen, dining room, everything. <clears throat> and I got that for $2,500. Now, anybody, when you're going to rent a four bedroom house for $2,500, it's absolutely remarkable. And he filed in court that I was living in extravagance. Yeah. And amongst many other things, he constantly filed and filed and filed. And then my lawyer at that time, who was a female, she said, you know, maybe it is you should just give him the kids. And I looked at her and I was like, are you really serious? You're advising me after knowing what I went through with this man and after everything you advised me? She said, yes, because, um, you know, things in court would be easier. You know, you, you would have to go back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, no, I want my children. Because he didn't want to pay maintenance. And he was throwing all these accusations at me. And she, on the other hand, is saying, well, give him the kids. He'll leave you alone. And I was stumped. I was like, are you on my side or on his side? And it was then I went to legal aid. Um, and I had to ask them for a reassignment of a lawyer. And they gave me actually a male lawyer. And I really had doubts about this male lawyer. But every single thing that I told him, he went to court and he fought. Every single thing, my ex, my ex had a, a female lawyer. And she, boy, she was, she was brutal. The, the lawyer actually looked at me with heat. And I realized, okay, he painted a picture with this lawyer about me and he painted a picture with a lot of people because my sister had gone to work at the end she knew this she knew this um girl and this she the, her friends started speaking about this woman and then my sister was like so who are you talking about and then she was like um well and then she ended up saying my name to my sister what coincidentally my was my sister was like are you serious? But that's my sister. She was like, oh my God. Yes, well, I heard that, you know, she was a very horrible person. And it was then my sister relayed the story to her friend at work. And then I realized that he was going all over, tainting my name, saying horrible things about me. And, you know, people were getting a picture. He was making himself out to be the victim. And my mom asked me, what's going to do? And I'm like, I'm not going to do anything. At the end of the day, who wants to talk? Whoever has an idea about me, they can, you know, they can go ahead. Because I, I, I had reached a point where I, do, I didn't care anymore. I don't care what people think. Right now I have my freedom. And, and I don't know about anybody, but I love my freedom at this point in time. And I like how my life is going. It, it may not have been ideal, but one foot in front of the other every day. And I was, I was just going. I didn't care. I wasn't letting anybody stop me. Yeah, even things like that. I mean, you're not in front of him and you're not living with him. That, but that is an extension of mental abuse. To say things that are really not true uh, with the expectation, probably, I don't know that it would bother you to the point that, that it, it would, you know, mess you up in your head, I mean, it, it, it is still mental abuse. You're just not in front of the person. And in your case, even after you leave, did the person still tried to to control you or to do things that would kind of get him to get his life how he wanted or upset you to the point that that you're upset and, and you be, basically can't function. And thankfully, that hasn't worked. And you're able to now live true to yourself, authentic to yourself as, as who you are in your freedom, being who you want to be and being an inspiration for other women. So is there anything else you want to share that you think would help anyone, anything that you went through or any tip you want to give? My biggest advice to women out there is do not listen to the naysayers don't don't take to heart what people may tell you because if you want better for yourself 
better is out there. And a lot of people are going to throw and say, you know, it's really hard out there. And what about the kids? And what about this? And you know what? At the end of the day, everybody will survive. Everybody. Everybody. Because you can't just hope that everything changes in one day. Any small changes that happen, be thankful, thankful for it. And what I did was, if you were a negative person, I cut that out immediately. I remember getting rid of a lot of family and a lot of friends because they weren't on my path. They weren't for me. And sometimes that's what you need to do. Yeah. And, and I think you are definitely testimony to that. Everything may not go as you planned. Everything may not be clear in front of you. But once you you are clear in respect of what you want, it will come. It may not come in a flash. It may not come the next day. But it will come. There's and something else I, I, I really want to point out that. Yes. Yeah. As unfortunate as my situation may have been, but in every workplace that I have ever worked, I have always met a person who was in a similar situation. And through my experiences, I was able to help. And I don't know if that was faith, but in some way it was just, it, it gave me a lot of hope that, you know what, my situation was something for me to learn to help others. And that's why I've become a lot more vocal. And in doing so, a lot of people don't like that, the fact that I'm a lot vocal. <laughs> because they, they miss the quiet Terentia, but I'm no longer the quiet Terentia. So, but I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I've, I have helped one or two women along the way. Yeah, and even just helping one is, mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a lot. And a lot of things, I, I want to really draw on, on what you said there, because a lot of times, you know, we wonder why we go through all of this. And, and your situation, the things that you would have had to, to go through, I mean, like, to me, it's just unbearable. Like, I can't fathom it. But to have that perspective of whatever we have gone through is our journey and we use it to help other people, that, that, is, that is really um, the point of the series, to help persons through compassion because we really don't want anybody else to go through what we went through. And if we could do anything to help someone who is going through that or to prevent it altogether, that that is our contribution to the world a lot of, of persons think contributions is only monetary but it is not it is mm -hmm. what we do it is the connections we make and the people we help yeah definitely and i i do definitely think i i may not have met you if you would not have gone through that that whole situation and i am very grateful that you are my friend same here, same here, Trishta, same here. I know for a fact that when I joined your class to dance, that was a most freeing experience because it's something that I wanted to do. And when I saw you there dancing with such passion, I realized, yes, because I've always had a love for dance. And when I saw you there just being free and I attended every class, it, it really, it really made my day. I, I'm so happy. And, and that is what I, I want. I want women, you know, to be free to be whoever they want to be. There's no definition of, of what the perfect woman is. We are all going through our own situations and, and perfect in our own little ways. And freedom looks different to everyone. But that, that is what I want um, from this series. For whoever is watching that you find your true, true authentic self and, and you find the things that drive you and, and make you excited to get up every day and, and to live every day and to walk every step with the persons around you. And the one thing I'm grateful um, about Zumba, which is really my space of freedom, is that I meet so many wonderful people, uh, Terentia being one of them, who 
have influenced me and, and who have supported me. And I, I really genuinely mean it when I say it, I'm really grateful for your friendship. I am glad that I know an individual who has gone through so much, but has used that to grow and to help to help other persons along our our journey. We all need people like you. Thank you, Shushta. So um, as I close, I I would just I just want to wish you all the best on your journey and in your life. I know for certain once you continue to be the person that you are and you continue to live your true authentic self everything is going to come together and everything i actually see you coming out more being more of an advocate and helping other women in your own little way it may not be on a platform like this but in your own little way and i look forward to when you complete your public relations and communication course I can already see you on your platform, whatever it is, and I hope I can share in it in whatever way you need me to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so if you know someone in a domestic violence situation, the person can call 800-SAVE. At the end of this series, I will also post the website for a licensed therapist if you need to talk to a therapist who can help you with coping behaviors through situations like this you can contact one through the through their website so thank you everyone have a good day bye